Thank you, choir, orchestra, and welcome to all of our visitors. We trust you are sensing the manifest presence of Jesus here this morning. As you, as you heard, we just got back from Israel. We went there to dedicate, first of all, a church that uh, on Mount Carmel where Elijah uh, called fire down out of heaven, and I'm happy to announce to you the fire is still coming down out of heaven on Mount Carmel. We had two services, by the way, for those who prayed. You know, uh, this church knows that I don't like to fly. I'm one of those white knuckle flyers, but uh, we had. It was just like a dream, just like a pillow flight all the way there and back. So thanks for your prayers. <laughs> and uh, we had two services on uh, Saturday. Dedication. This church uh, is comprised of Arabs and Jews worshiping together. Had to have two services to, two services to accommodate the crowds. There were probably 800 in each service. The church seats about uh, 800, like with the overflow, about 800, and uh, they they have 12 stones around, representing the 12 stones that Elijah uh, built an altar with, and the spirit of the Lord was there mightily. Uh, and an unusual experience in one of the services, I think it was the first service, you know, Israel has two rains, the former and latter, the early and the spring rain and the fall rain. <clears throat> they hadn't had rain in five months and still two months yet before the rains come. I, I was preaching on judgment that's coming to America. And as soon as I said judgment is coming to America, there was a lightning bolt and a thunder that shook the building and the rain fell absolutely fell on Mount Carmel and the people are just praising the Lord. And I didn't know what was going on and, and until I find later that they hadn't had a drop of rain in all this time. And there was this one clap of thunder and it seemed that God was putting an exclamation mark on what his servant was saying from the pulpit. I'll tell you, it left a mark. It left a mark on me. And uh, it was, it was an incredible experience. And uh, we bring you greetings from David and Karen. Uh, David, the pastor, to you who don't know, was a, an actor here in the city. And uh, in fact, he, he, was, he was in a play right in this building. The Lord marvelously saved him, married a Jewish wife, and, and uh, there are pastors of that church sent out from this church. Our ministry, World Challenge in Texas, <clears throat> my international ministry, uh, people from all over the country that are on list uh, helped us, and this church, and though other 39 nations helped, most of the finances uh, came from this church and from World Challenge, and we're very thrilled. Remember when we came and we started this, God started this church, we said we wanted to honor Israel, and by honoring Israel, God would honor us, and he has. We were going to have communion every, every, month, every week. We were going to honor Israel, and because we honored Israel, he gave us the privilege uh, to build that church right on Mount Carmel. Then we had a, a conference in Jerusalem on Sunday, uh, they came from everywhere there, and I just felt that I had to prophesy, and I preached a very had to preach a very hard message because in Israel there are uh, there are two kinds of Jews: there are religious Jews and there are secular Jews. The religious Jews are in a minority; the majority are secular who don't even believe in God. The cab drivers, God, where was he during the Holocaust? If there was a God, Jesus, he may be okay, but God, where was he? And, uh, and you know, on the mosque there, the big mosque, the Muslim mosque, uh, there's, there's a great big lettering up there that says, God had no son. God had no son. And uh, <clears throat> the, the Spirit of the Lord came down, by the way, on the second service in... Uh, on Mount Carmel, the Holy Spirit came upon me to ask. There, there was such a sense of hopelessness in so many people. I said, how many of you have been con contemplating suicide? Fifteen people came forward that 
were contemplating suicide. And I thank God for his faithfulness. And, and uh, the, the Lord also touched many, many hearts in Jerusalem. I want to go now into the message. As you know, I've been busy <coughs> finishing another book. The first book that went out across the United States is up to around 300,000 have gone. And it's just now beginning to go to bookstores all over the country. And it's had quite an impact. It was called America. It's called America's Last Call uh, on the Brink of a Financial Holocaust. And uh, this new book is called, is entitled God's Plan to Keep His People in the Coming Depression. This is the 10th message I will have preached on that subject. There's one more next week, God willing, and then the book is finished. And you people have had, I've been testing these messages on you. I've been giving them to you first, and then uh, next month this goes to print. And uh, we've been having a demand for it. It's going to go into about 40 languages immediately. And we're going to share with you the tenth of that. And you may not understand the first how my message title fits the first 15 minutes of this, 10, 15 minutes of the message, but you'll see it as we go along, entitled, A Craving for the Presence of the Lord. A Craving for the Presence of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, you must come upon me now with your anointing and your touch. There's no man that can speak this prophetic word in his own strength and power. Lord, we are in a time that frightens our flesh. And in the natural, we can't receive these things. There has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in us to receive them. Now, Father, I come here now just to deliver your mind, that which you've put in my heart at the throne of our everlasting God. Lord, this is a time for us to hear and understand and know what you are about to do. You will not keep your people in ignorance or in darkness. And we are asking you now, Lord, to encourage our hearts by the word, and you will, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, you've heard me refer quite often uh, in the past uh, few months about the coming storm in the United States and America, an economic storm. I started warning that almost six months before the Asian collapse a year and a half ago, and uh, then it broke over not only Asia, but Russia. And few people want to hear it, I noticed. Even when I was in Israel, and, and they'd say, what do you think is coming? And we hear what you're saying. And after about five minutes, you could see they, they just wanted to change the subject. I, I was with an attorney friend the other day, and, and he said, Reverend Wilkerson, he said, I know a storm is coming. I know something unusual. You can feel it. You feel it in Wall Street. You feel it everywhere. Something incredible is about to happen. But he said, I really don't want to hear it. He said, I just kind of hope it'll go away. You see, what I'm preaching to you is very tame to what the secularists are preaching now. And the warning that's coming from economic export, uh, experts here in the United States and even around the world. I've been warning of a, a ruinous storm that's coming to the United States and to the whole world. But listen to what a secular economist said this past month. He said, if, if there were an economics channel on TV, like a weather channel, that be frenetic newscasters would be interrupting regular programs right now and give us an hourly update on something that they would be calling the storm of the century an economic cataclysm as big or bigger than the Great Depression of the 30s. But if God, God forbid, if it reaches the United States, watch out. Stock prices could easily fall two-thirds, 6,000 points on the Dow, and it could take a decade or more to recover. He said, this storm that's coming is chilling. That's a secular writer. Now, when I say something like that, even ministers' conference is taken, uh, it's, it's considered some kind of theological uh, aberration. It's considered just my opinion, and even Pentecostal ministers don't want to hear it much anymore. This writer, though, goes on to paint a picture of an economic meltdown that could wipe out investors, and it could even wipe out mutual funds 
some mutual funds entirely, absolutely wipe out mutual funds. Now, I've been saying and prophesying that the market would go down 5,000 points, and then I picked up this uh, writer's note, and he says 6,000. They go beyond what we are saying. <clears throat> now, beloved, like it or not, whether we want to hear it or not, and you might want to shut it out of mind and say, Pastor, move on. Now, I, I tell you, you come this afternoon, you come this evening, you're going to hear uh, you're going to hear encouraging words. You're going to hear about communion with Christ. You're going, to talk, you're going to hear about growth. You're going to be encouraged and all these things. My role as a watchman is to, 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 to warn his body. I have to do what I'm called to do. So, uh, and God balances that by bringing other messages. And, and one time soon, believe it or not, soon he'll let me get into that stream. In October the 24th, 1929, the day the stock market broke and ushered in the Great Depression, a writer called Elliot Bell, who was there on Wall Street when it happened. I was down the other day walking on Wall Street after I got back from Israel. In fact, I think it was Thursday. I, was, I went down to Wall Street just to feel, and I had some business there, and it was incredible, the feeling there that there's something in the air. And he writes these words, and this was October 24th, 1929, the day the market broke. He said, it was the most terrifying, unreal day I've ever seen on Wall Street. He said it began with a cool, on a cool overcast day. It was about 50 degrees. The wind was blowing softly through the canyons of Wall Street, the temperature in the 50s. Bankers and brokers were buttoning up their coats on the way to the exchange. But about 11 o'clock, <clears throat> a storm broke. I've been telling you about a storm. They use these terms. A storm broke, a deluge. It came with such a ferocity that left everybody on Wall Street dazed. The bottom just fell out of the market for no reason. Wall Street became a nightmarish spectacle. Traders who just a few short days before luxuriated in delusions of wealth saw all their hopes smashed and collapsed in a devastating storm. So far beyond their wildest fears, it was almost unreal. The storm created a sense of danger like men trying to hold on to a sinking ship. He said the sense of danger. I felt it the other day when I was there. Folks, we no longer, I'm no longer saying a storm is coming. I'm telling you it's already overhead. It's here. <clears throat> now, you, you could say, Pastor, what does all of that have to do with your title? thought you were here to encourage us. A craving for the presence of the Lord. Folks, it has to do with everything about our spiritual condition when the storm comes, how we respond, how we as Christians react when we are facing a change in lifestyles that will never again be like they are now. How does that affect us? All of this news that we hear, all of these things that we may not want to hear, but we know intuitively that it's going to happen. How are we going to react? And folks, when I look into the future and I see these black clouds and I hear the thunder peeling already and the lightning, I, I, and I have a sense in me that everything the prophets have prophesied, all, every prophet in the Old the New Testament, everything they've said is about to be fulfilled. And as a Christian spirit filled, you, you, if you're walking in the spirit, you have got to sense it also. It's a revelation of the Holy Spirit that everything is winding up and we are coming now to midnight. There's a sense that every prophecy is being fulfilled. Everything we've preached about for years, everything we've talked about in this book is now coming down upon us. The ends of all things have come upon us. And we are there, folks. We are there. And then when I see this and I feel it in the spirit, then I know that every foolish, frivolous thing in my life has to go out the window. When I sense by the Spirit, and he begins to speak so strongly, not just through your pastor here, but through many, many, even secularists, then I know that every ungodly ambition has to end. 
Every covetous desire has to go. Every root of bitterness, every selfish dream, every attachment to the things of this world, everything that's corrupted or hindered a blessed communion with Jesus, it all has to go. Things have to change. It can't be life as usual. There has to be something we do. There has to be a change in our walk with God. When I hear and see the shaking, and God said you're going to shake everything that could be shaken, and when I see fear and panic coming upon nations, and, and I see this global superpower about to be uh, shamed, and its economy smashed before the whole world, by the way, we already are the laughing stock of the world. And while the world is crumbling all around us, the whole nation is absorbed in some sexual debauchery in the White House. It's incomprehensible to the world. Pick up the paper in Israel and you see the picture of the president with the nose of Pinocchio. Liar, liar. And everybody is laughing. America is the laughing stock of the world right now. It's part of the judgment of Almighty God. When I look about now and I see this shaking, then you have to come to the question, what is going to be the most important thing in your life in this time? What's going to be the most important thing, folks? You're not going to be thinking by psychosis then. You're not going to be thinking about your psychi psychiatrist in the couch. You're not going to be thinking about whether you like your job or whether you're fulfilled in your job. No, it's all going to boil down to, to some very, very simple questions. What are the most important issues now? I found my answer in Israel. When I was in Israel, I asked my host David to take me to a lonely spot way up on top. They call it Carmel, up on Mount Carmel. And I said, just drop me off. And I gave him a, a time hours later. I said, come pick me up. And I, I was suddenly out overlooking the valley where Elijah outran into Jezreel for 26 miles, outran Ahab, King Ahab's chariot. And I'm looking down at that valley. I said, somewhere there was a dusty road there, and he ran. It takes, it takes 30 minutes to get there by car. Can you imagine what it took for him? And, and I'm, I'm saying somewhere, not far from where I am, praying right now the prophet called Elijah built an altar and called fire out of heaven and 400 prophets were slain and their blood is on this land somewhere and and uh, how they got uh, how they got all those barrels of water in a famine I don't know and up on that mountain how they got them there I don't know but those things are very real but I was I was I was expecting some kind of historical sense to hit me some great release in prayer uh, that, 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 boy, I'm in Israel. I'm right where the prophet stood, and I, I am praying where Elijah prayed. And God said, He's a man of like passions, and I can pray just like him. And then I look to, 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 to the east, and there's the Mediterranean overlooking Haifa. And I said, That little cloud came right over the probably was now the port of Haifa. I said, Lord, that cloud was right there. The rain fell right here, and I waited for it to hit me, and nothing hit me. Uh, it, it may have had something to do with the, the Coke cans and the McDonald wrappers uh, all over the ground. I don't know. It could have been the car over there where two kids were making out, I, you know, on Mount Carmel. It had nothing hit me after hours. Now, I had a wonderful time with the Lord, but there was no sense. There, there was something almost of, wait a minute, I, I, I'm feeling a little lonely here. We went to the tomb. And there's the Hill of the Skull. And I, I was there after the Six-Day War years ago, and it wasn't commercialized. But now it, it's T-shirt country. But, but I, I, I walk in the tomb, and I'm, I thought, well, maybe in the tomb I'll feel that sense. I remember when I was there the first time, I came home feeling the same way. And I said, Lord, what's wrong? He said, well, it's more important that I walk where you walk rather than you walk where I walked. I want to walk with you where you walk. And I never forgot that. But, you know, uh, even the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't know whether it was all the commercialism around there or, or, or what, but there was no sense of a release in prayer. 
Nothing hit me. In fact, I had some wonderful times in prayer. I, 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 I didn't go to sightsee, and, and, and uh, I was there when Gwen got on a camel <laughs> and screamed, ah, when that thing went up. But I had some wonderful times in prayer. I mean, pouring my heart out to the Lord, but it, it didn't hit me till I got on the plane and 30,000 feet over the Atlantic in a sense, I'm, I'm going to a place. And I was feeling the drawing of that. I wasn't going just to where we live. I was going to a place in the house where we live. I was going to a room. You see, it's my craving room. It's my Gethsemane. It's my Mount Carmel. It's a place where I go to vent my longings and my cravings for him. It's a trysting spot that's known only to me. You see, Elijah probably went up there many times to pray. Jesus uh, uh, went many times into the garden to pray. It was a special place. And every prophet in the Bible had that special place. And Jesus, I know, had a special place. And he went up to mountains to pray. And when I got off the plane, the first chance I had after getting rid of jet lag... I went into that room, and I shut the door, and I raised my hands, and I began to weep. And I said, Jesus, I have missed you so. I've been so hungry to get back in this room. Because, you see, the word crave means to long, to be earnestly desire, to go after, to pursue. It's, it's a, the craving room, as I describe it, is, is some place where I go not to get prayers answered, though I ask him and I lay before him all those things. It's a place where I love him, a place where I'm drawn nigh to him. It's a place where I, I, I embrace him and he embraces me. There's a craving, and that craving gets stronger and stronger is every time I go into that room. I've come to the following conclusions, and I want you to listen very closely. I, I am, first of all, fully convinced that God's going to miraculously protect and provide for his people in the difficult times that are ahead. That's beyond question. He said, Je the Bible says, Jesus said, I know what you need before you ask. That's enough for me. He knows what we're going to need. He said, I, and, and I'm an earthly father. I've got uh, five children and 11 grandchildren. And if I were a rich man like my heavenly father is and I had all the resources and I saw one of my children suffering, I would take care of them. How much more, he said, if you earthly know how to do that, how much more will your heavenly father? So it's beyond question that God's going to provide. He's going to provide food and water and shelter. He's not going to feed you filet mignon, but he is going to give you all the rice and beans you need, anything that is practical. He's going to give supernatural guidance and direction on how to prepare. If you're in business and you're, and you're in love with Jesus and you believe uh, that he said he knows what you need, you seek him and he'll give you direction in your business. He'll give you direction in your family and in your home. But listen closely, please. Having a long-term miraculous supply of every need being met can become a damning experience. Let me run it by you again. Having all your needs miraculously supplied over a long period of time, miraculously, can become a damning experience. Now consider the children of Israel in that desolate wilderness. Forty long years God provided. You know their tents never deteriorated. No, no tears. They moved and moved. Not a single tear. No deterioration. Rain didn't come through. He covered, folks, you, if you want to know heat, you go into some of those uh, Judean hills and the valleys at 105. And, 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 and uh, especially if you're near the Mediterranean and the oppressive heat and the oppressive, uh, what do you call it, uh, humidity. Do you understand the miracle of that cloud that God sent miraculously to cover them? Or they would have died under that oppressive heat, especially from noon to three o'clock. 
Their clothes never wore out. Their turbans never wore out. Their, their sandals never wore out. Now, surely, I'm not saying that God expanded them when you grew up. I think they traded around, but those, God, they never wore out. No, I believe God can cause shoes to grow. If you've heard it said, somebody said all day, God didn't open, they didn't go through the Red Sea. The Red Sea at that time was... It was only three feet deep and they walked through. And he said, well, it's a greater miracle that God could destroy a whole army in three feet of water. <laughs> These people ate angels food. Nobody was employed. Total unemployment. <laughs> and you're worried about your job. Total unemployment. And God took care of every single need in their hard times. God did everything for them that we hope he'll do for us today in our hard times. He did it. He doesn't have to prove it over again. He did it. He's going to do it. They were preserved and protected miraculously while all the nations around them were in turmoil. Egypt was in ruins. Egypt was devastated. There was no food. Remember, God had devastated Egypt, and here they are, devastation all around them, all around the nations being devastated, and here they are, food, water, protection, and, and, and they're, they're surviving very well while everything is in ruins around them. But they got bored. They murmured. They complained, even while they enjoyed the miracle blessings of God. Now, folks, this, this, this has got to be absorbed now before these things come. Because here we sit in Times Square Church in all of this wonderful splendor. September the 20th, 1998, the American stock market is trembling. Asia is falling into depression. Japan is on the brink. The president of Sony again said that they are going into total depression. And now Korea, Russia... Brazil is next, followed by Argentina, Latin America, and then Mexico. They're all going down, and soon Brazil is going to devalue its currency. Argentina has to do it, and finally Mexico will do it. And folks, that is where our banks are so vulnerable here in the United States and our entire uh, Wall Street structure. <clears throat> but in the midst of all this frightful news that I've been telling you about. Here I come, and I, I give you this good news. Folks, isn't it good news God's going to take care of his people? Isn't that wonderful news? It's absolutely wonderful that God is going to take loving care of us in this time, in this age, just as he did in that time of that age. But let me give you this warning, please. Even though I believe God wants us to do our part and, pre and prepare and, and I'll tell you now that we're meeting next week with our pastors and elders to pray about what we should share with you on how to prepare, physically prepare uh, for what is coming. But I want to tell you, you can have a 10-year supply of rice and beans. You, you can have acreage out in a country somewhere, and you've got your own generator, your own well. In fact, you have got it all down. All the survivalists have told you how to prepare for the coming crisis of the Depression, and you've got everything like the rich man who sat there and said, I am set for life. You can have it all and be the most bored, confused person in the world because you missed the point. You had the wrong focus. You wanted God's provision and not his presence. I'm telling you, if personal security becomes the focus, then we're going to end up like the children of Israel about after... Now, you Puerto Ricans may not believe this, but you get tired of rice and beans after a certain amount of time. Forgive me, I'm sorry. You see, if all you're trying to do is survive an economic depression or a chaos, what 
point is that if you have everything and you sit there through that bored, murmuring, complaining, looking back to the good life, you don't have the presence of the Lord in you or with you, and you're growing more and more bitter and sour, even though sitting there while everybody around you is, is suffering and you're sitting there in the lap of the good things, those good things will make you bored and restless and empty without the presence of the Lord. Jesus said, is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And what he's saying, don't focus on, he, he said, don't say what shall we eat and what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be taken care of. They'll be added unto you. The Lord says, no, it's not about security. It's about your relationship with me. He's saying, don't focus on that. If you will focus on my presence in your life, if you will deal with sin in your life, if you will seek me with everything that's in you, I'll take care of you. You take care of your heart, I'll take care of your basket. There's nobody in this world now that convinced me that America's going to miss having a full-blown depression. Nobody in the world, because the Holy Ghost has convinced me. I am totally convinced. I don't get this just from reading books and economists' uh, amusings. More than that, it's something clear from the Word of God and things that we know. And I don't care if the stock market bounces back to 15,000 points and be the biggest fool's market in the world's history. And the higher it goes, the worse will be the fall. But Moses knew well that without the presence of the Lord with them, not he or the nation could make it through the perilous times that had befallen them. Moses knew that he had to have more than a legal contract with God. Now, I want you to follow closely. Remember that the setting here is that Israel had corrupted themselves by worshiping a golden idol and the whole nation had risen up to eat and drink and play before this idol in nakedness and shame. And God was angered by this blatant idolatry. And he said, my wrath is wax and hot against them. He said to Moses, I'm going to consume them. And you know that Moses prevailed with God and God had mercy on them and he spared Israel, but on one awful condition. He said, all right, I'm going to let you go up to the land of milk and honey. You go on. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of your enemies. I'll send hornets before you. I'll, I, in fact, am going to send an angel with you to lead you on. But he said, I'm not going with you. I'm not going, my presence will no longer be in your midst. I am leaving the camp. Moses cried out to God. Well, here's, here's, here's what the scripture said. Go on your way. I will not go with you. I will send an angel to go before thee, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. Moses takes his tent outside the camp. His own tent takes it outside the camp, far away, to begin to intercede before God. And this is his prayer. He said, oh, God, this people have sinned a great sin and have made Gods of gold. Now, I want you to look at this. He separated this two. There are, are two evils here. One evil, the result of the first. He, he said, they, they have committed a great sin. And this is another sin. They have built a golden idol. In fact, this building the golden idol was a result of this great sin of Israel. It's the sin of today, just as it was the sin then. What is this incredible, awful sin that Israel committed that Moses is crying out and said, Oh, Lord, we have committed a great sin against you. That great sin of then and today is a lack of respect for the presence of the Lord in our personal lives. It's a lack of respect, a lack of desire for the presence of the Lord in our lives, lightly esteeming the presence of the Lord, not having a craving in the heart to honor and preserve his presence in our life. It is to want his provision, to want his protection, and to not crave after his presence, the very presence that makes the provisions possible.
I'm telling you sadly, and I see something, and it really hit me this past week. Now, I want every one of you here today that call yourself a Christian, you say, I, I am a Christian. I'm a believer. Somewhere along the line, you heard a pastor, minister, somebody testified to you about the word of God and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Reach into your heart and get a hold of faith. Lay hold of that promise and believe that Jesus died for your sins. Finish the work. You claim it. It's a legal contract. It's a covenant God has made with you. Believe and thou shalt be saved. And you did that and rightly so. And that's fine. You are legally saved. You are under contract. You've been brought into the family of God. But if all you have is a legal contract and a legal covenant with God, you've missed the point. It will never lead you to holiness. It will never lead you to desire. You will never know him in his fullness because you are standing on a legal contract. It, what Bible says this, I claim it. But where's the affection? Where is the love? Where is that craving in your heart? Where is that love? The Bible said you are now a son of God. But where is that love a son should have a father who adopted him? Where is it? I don't see it in the land. I, 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 I picked up a, a sermon, a written sermon. Someone gave it to me from uh, inter, the internet. And it's a powerful, brilliant sermon by a man I know. A man, a preacher who smokes and drinks. And every time you see him in a restaurant, he's surrounded with beautiful actresses. A, a, a lawlessness. And what a sermon. He says, reach down into your gut. Pull up some faith. Lay a hold of the promise of the finished work of Christ. And don't ever let anybody shake you. But it's all legal. There is no love. There is no devotion. There is no crying out to God. There's no desire for the holiness of God. Because anyone who's shut in with God and craving his presence, that holy presence in his life will conform you to the image of Christ. God offered Moses and Israel this legal deal. He said, I promise to send an angel before you. I'll take care of you. I'll defeat all your enemies. I'll give you a land of milk and honey. Now that's saying, I'll give you salvation. I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. And it's all legal. It's a legal deal. It's a covenant. God made it. And he made it to a stiff-necked people that hadn't changed. They still had no hunger or thirst after him. He, out of sheer mercy, and that's what it is. Salvation is absolute mercy. The mercy of God came and found you. And you have a legal contract. I'm a son of God. The Bible says that that settles it. And so many go on their stiff-necked way, neglecting him. They don't pray. They don't seek the face of God. There's no love. There's no devotion. And all the time God had said to Israel, I'm bringing you out of Egypt. I'll break your bondage, but I want you to love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. This was a love affair. And here's an offer of a legal deal. God says, I have given you my binding promises. And you know, that's, that's, that's all some people want. Now, I know I'm not going to hell. I've been saved. And there are some people believe that they're saved and they can live like the devil and still go to heaven. What a surprise awaits those poor blinded souls. You see, the stiff necked people had no desire to get to know him or to embrace him. And now you and I have two testaments, the old and the new, filled with legal promises that are yea and amen to everyone who believes. Yes, they are. He will keep his word. He will feed you. He will clothe you. He will house you. He will make sure that the enemies don't prevail over you. He's not going to keep you rich, but he'll keep you supplied.
Now, you can go on with that legal deal. You can go on with that. He'll keep his word to you. But see, Israel now has for the first time to deal with this issue of God's presence. They'd never dealt with it before. They had just taken everything for granted. They took lightly the presence of the Lord. They saw all of his blessings and provisions and and got bored under it all and really had no heart for him. But now they've heard the word. God says, you've got your legal deal. Now you go on your own way. I'm not going with you. I'll protect you. I'll supply all your needs. Now, if that's all you want, folks, you can have it. If, you, if all you think, well, well, there's a depression coming, hard times. Uh, I want my legal deal. I want to make sure there's food, every, everything else. That's enough for me. I, I have this settled faith. I've believed. I'm saved. I'm not going to hell. He's going to take care of me. Good. And when the people heard the evil tidings, you know, that the Lord was presence was going to leave. They mourned and no man did put on his ornaments. Now, up to this moment, the men had been strutting around the wilderness, laden down with foolish ornaments. They, they got it from Egypt, ankle bracelets, arm bracelets, armlet bracelets, trinkets of brass hanging down their neck. Trading around with the old baggage of Egypt. But now the message has come. My presence will not go with you. And so now they take off all of their ornaments. And they begin to mourn. Mourn means to weep and cry and lament. They were crying and weeping and lamenting. Now that's a message many churches don't want to hear. You can go to nine out of ten churches in New York. And if I got up and preached about come to the Lord and mourn for your sins. and, And get rid of all the baggage of your past life. Half the congregation would think I'm stupid or walk out. You don't want to hear it. Believe. And then God comes. They'd already put off their ornaments. And here's what he said. Now put off your ornaments. They'd already put them off. And he's coming back. Put them off now that I may know what to do with you. What he's saying. All right. You put them off temporarily, but leave them off. Don't go back to your old ways. Don't cry and mourn and then go put your ornaments back on. Don't go back to the old sins. Don't go back to your old life, your old way of thinking. Leave it. God God seems to be saying uh, an unusual thing here. It's almost like God sounds undecided. He said, take off your ornaments until I decide what I'm, I don't know what to do with you yet. He knew exactly what he was going to do, and he's waiting for something, and he found what he's waiting for in that tent out far from the camp. Because there is Moses. God found the man who is going to give him what he's looking for, what he's been waiting for all of this time, not some kind of a legal contract, not just somebody relying on the promises of God and begging and seeking for answers to prayer and having protection for their flesh. God says, I'm after more than that. And he found it in that tent. He found a pastor. He found an associate pastor, Joshua. He found those men on their face before God. And in this perilous times, they they turned away from all of their activities, every demand on their time. Everything had to go so that they could Pour their hearts out before the Lord. And folks, I believe in these perilous times, God is going to raise up a holy remnant, just like these, the Bible said, everyone which sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle, which was outside the camp. This means they made a special effort. They got up every day and they went out where Moses was pleading with God, laying hold of God. I ask you, Christian, do you have that time? I'm not talking about a five-minute devotion. Do you have a craving room anywhere? Do you have a trysting spot? Do you have some place where you get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, I want more than this legal deal. I want to know you. I want your presence in my life. I want to feel you. Folks, I go into my craving room and say, Lord, 
I take it by faith. Yes, but I want to feel your presence. I want to feel your love and I want you to feel mine. It's a feeling thing. They're mourning over the sins of the nation. You know, you hear it say, where's the outrage about what's happening in Washington? Where's the outrage? When a majority of the people say it's okay as long as the economy is good. Where's the outrage? I'll tell you where the outrage is. (laughs) It's right here. These people are mourning for the sins of Israel. Now they are mourning. It's not where you just get up in, the, up in the pulpit and you scream out again. I could stand and give you a scathing message. I, I, I could rip Washington apart. I've got something in my gut and my flesh that would probably want to do it. But that's not the answer. The answer is in the, on your face before God, mourning before him and repenting for the whole nation. Us repenting. The outrage is expressed to the Lord, not to man. And oh, I've, I've expressed, I've been outraged. Yes, I've raised my hands in my craving room and cried out before God and confessed not only my sins, but the sins of the nation. Out of this prayer time came a cry, Lord, if your presence goes not with me, carry us no further. Boy, this is a this is a powerful statement. He's saying, Lord, unless you unless I can have your presence, unless I have face to face intimacy with you, unless I can come to you and know that you are right there, I feel and I know and I sense your presence. And remember, the Bible says this man talked face to face with God, and he said, "I will not lose that. I am not going. I don't care what promises. I don't care what legally it is. I don't care if you send a host of angels." No angel for me. You know, a couple of years ago, they were, they were books about angels, and you go to the bookstore, are angels. One, one woman told me she got in the car and looked back, and there was a 12 foot angel in the back. I thought, how can a 12 foot angel get in a six foot car? You know? <laughs> if you want an angel, the Bible said the angel of the Lord camps around about them that fear him. You've got your angel. Go your way satisfied. Eat all the water, all the food. Bored, murmuring, complaining. Whereas you can just say, oh, Jesus, this is not about my surviving. This is about my getting to know you in hard times. This is giving me time to crave and yearn after you and get to know you with everything that's in my heart. And he says to God, Lord, if you're not going to go with me, if your presence is not with me every day I got up and every waking hour, I'm stopping right here. I'm going to die. I have had it. I'm not going another step. You're not going to get a craving for the Lord in these hard times unless you pray for it. It's in that secret closet. It's in that place where you reach out and say, oh, God created me a hunger and thirst after you. God, by his spirit, creates that. It's not, you can't do it in your human flesh. Now, you can hear the word and be convicted, and then you go to prayer and say, oh, God, I want you with everything that's in my heart. Now, here's what he's saying. Lord, thank you for your generous, gracious promise to take care of us. Thank you for your covenant promises to deal with our enemies. Thank you for the promise of the angel. But Lord, we don't want to go that legal path. We want to go the love way. We want to be devoted to you. Hallelujah. Then he knew, he knew God would be faithful. He knew God would take care of him as he did in the past. But now he's drawing it. Folks, let me close with an illustration. <clears throat> One of the highlights of our visit to Israel was to visit two wonderful sisters of Mary. This is a Lutheran organization, have their headquarters in Darmstadt, Germany. I, I've known them for 40 years. They're wonderful people. Sister Basilia Slink is one of the great saints of this generation. She's 94 years old and still praising Jesus. <laughs> 
as of this time. And these two sisters have been on, on the Mount of Olives. They, they, they have a compound there. They have a, about a three, four-story house there overlooking the old city. And we went to visit. There's two sisters been there 36 years. 36 years of ministering to Arabs and Jews. Saintly. You can feel the presence of the Lord when you walk in. And they served us some tea and cookies. And they, they began to tell us about the war that came. And the Jordanian army came and surrounded and dug trenches all around their compound. And they were screaming and yelling. They were convinced they're going to take Jerusalem. And the, one of the <clears throat> officials came and told the sisters, you better get out. The war is going to break out shortly. There's going to be bombing and strafing, and you're going to be right in the middle. Because the Israeli army is going to come from the, the left and over here to the right. The Jordanians have dug in their trenches and ready. And they prayed. And the Lord gave them a word, the same word he gave to uh, Gideon. I'm going to be with you. Don't be afraid. And the Lord told them to store up food before all this happened. They, in the basement, they had a full storage of food and water and supplies. The war broke out. Israelis came from one side, <coughs> strafing, uh, <coughs> bombs, and <coughs> the house was hit. The came right through the roof. The walls collapsed. One wall, one wall remained, one corner of a wall that had a plaque on it. God will keep his people, words to that. God will protect his people. The plaque stood there as a testimony. An another uh, shell came through and broke through two floors, but it didn't break into the basement. And those dear saints, they, they had food. They had water. No bullet could touch them. No bomb could bomb them out. And they were there for 14 days in that basement. One, one almost broke through, but they fell on some, I think it was a pile of carpets or something they had in the corner, fell right on those carpets and didn't do any harm. But they told us, and the thing that blessed my heart, they said, it wasn't that God, so much, we thank God that he protected us. And he, he provided the food. He told us how to prepare. That was all wonderful. But she said, if all of our years in Israel, those were the most precious hours we've ever spent because Jesus manifested himself in that basement. The presence of Jesus, as we've never known. She said, we look back, those were the most precious 14 days of our life in a basement because Jesus so revealed himself and they were, had such craving hearts. They, they, they just wanted more and more and more. And even today, they look back. They are, their work is finished. They leave in November. They go back to Darmstadt after 36 years. But they go back with this precious memory. And folks, they still have craving heart for Jesus. But in the hard times, they look back. They're not thinking food. They're not thinking shelter. Or even protection for the flesh. It was the revelation of the presence of Jesus Christ. Folks, in the days ahead, I've told you this. Pastor Carter's told you this. And I believe with all my heart. We are going to see manifestations of the presence of Jesus as no other generation has seen it. Paul the Apostle would be jealous if he could, he could even be near it. Every prophet in the Old Testament had yearned for it and see it. We are going to see it. You think it's wonderful. Sometimes you come here and the present Lord just comes down and we can't even talk. We sit here for 15 minutes in total silence, just drinking. Wait till the manifestations that you see when you come with a craving heart. And it's only going to, it's only going to be revealed to the craving hearts. You've got to come with a craving heart to yearn after. I'm going to church not to hear Brother Dave or Pastor Carter or any other pastors. I'm not going there to try to get a word that God's going to somehow keep me. I've got a craving heart. I want to get to know Jesus better.
Do you understand any of this? <laughs> I do. It's all about Jesus. It's all about seeking him first, giving him everything in your life. Check your devotion. Are you dissatisfied to hand out money and be charitable? Is it just enough to be good? No, the Bible said all your goodness is filthy rags in your sight. No, 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 no. He says, love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Love me. Give me your heart. Folks, I heard that and I'm doing that. And I am so enjoying because you see, the more you crave, because he, this man, Moses had such a craving heart. And God says, all right, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you my presence. But then he comes back again. He's so craving after the Lord. He said, now show me your goodness. And the Lord said, I'll show you my goodness. And then we got the goodness. He said, now show me a revelation of your glory. This man's not going to stop. I'm going for the glory. I'm going to get to know who you are. I want a revelation of everything about you, Jesus. I'm not here on this world to live for myself and just to say I've finished 70 years and, and, and so forth. Pa Paul's whole thing was not I, I fought a good fight and I'm, I'm ready to be delivered. No, it, it was that Christ revealed himself not to me but in me. In all these times, I have a revelation of Christ. I know where I'm going and I know who he is. When I get there, I won't be a stranger. I know it. God, give me a heart of tenderness and of love that the word go forth, not in wrath, but in love. And I pray, Lord, that you change our hearts. Work a miracle in us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm about to say may shock some of you. But I believe it's the truth. I believe that the hardest hearts are not out there on the streets, but right here in the house of God. I'm going to say it again. The hardest hearts are not out in the street. The hardest hearts are not among the ungodly. The hardest hearts in the world happen in the house of God. When you think of hard-hearted people, who do you think about? You think about the gay march. 500,000 gays marching up Fifth Avenue last week with a big sign, Jesus is gay. And you say, surely those are the hard hearts. Those are hard and impossible to reach them. You think of hard hearts, you think of communism. You think of all of those communist nations, especially Cuba, just at our doorstep off the Florida coast. When communism came in, not only to Cuba, to Russia and other nations, they shut the churches, they began to persecute Christians, the churches became training centers for communism, and they boasted, we've done away with God, we've done away with religion, period. And we say, those communist leaders, those are hard hearts. Castro is a hard-hearted man. We think of the atheists, then like Madeleine Mary O'Hara, who was instrumental in getting prayer out of our schools here in the United States. She was one of the most notorious atheists in the history of America. She's vanished, by the way. She's disappeared, along with about $2 million. But her son, who was raised in that, has been marvelously delivered as in the ministry today. But when we think of hard hearts, we think, yes, Madeleine Mary O'Hara, the atheist, the communist, the hard-hearted militant gays, these are the hard hearts. I could go on and on describing all types of Christ rejectors and scoffers and mockers and blasphemers and God-haters. And yes, truly you could say among them are those who are hard-hearted. But if you want to discover the real hard heart, that God most despises, the hardest heart that God cannot endure is that which is in the house of God, his own house among his own people. <clears throat> According to God's word, the hardness of heart that is most despised by God has to do with hearing and rejecting the word of God. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. 
And the Hebrew word here is mapa, means without a possibility of a cure, without possibility of deliverance. Let me say it to you again. He that is often reproved, this has to be under the sound of the gospel. He that is reproved by the word of God. He that is reproved by corrective preaching by the Holy Ghost and hardens under that preaching, hardens under that message, does not obey it, does not work it through their body and their mind and their spirit, does not practice what is preached, and hardens under that, shall be cut off without a cure, without a possibility of ever being cured. Now, this is very serious, and I, I, I take this message so seriously this morning. I've prayed diligently. The Lord helped me minister it in love. Here's described a kind of hardness of heart that at some point becomes absolutely impossible to cure. And we've got to take it seriously because it's in the house of God. Now, think about the communists, for example. That's an incurable kind of hardness because the moment the Iron Curtain fell, the gospel went into Russia. Thousands of Red Army troops accepted Christ immediately. School teachers, those who were supposed to have been atheists, um, top generals began to ask for Bibles and began to preach to their troops. Top communists, those that were in, in their secret police have given their heart to the Lord and the gospel spread. We, we see people going into China or Russia right now from our own church this morning. You see, that hardness was curable because they hadn't had the light. They were not hardened by the gospel. They didn't sit under gospel reproof. Same with the atheist, the Madame Mary's uh, son, O'Hara's son, was raised in an atheist home, trained as an atheist, but he'd never heard the gospel. And when he heard it, he responded. His hardness was curable. And so it is with the gay marchers. We have many gays, now militant gays, that, that would curse Christ and shake their fist in his face when they heard the gospel and come under the reproof of the Holy Ghost, melted. I remember being in Poland, even when the communists were in control a number of years ago. It was the first time the communists allowed us in Poland to have open meetings. Thousands of young people gathered, and I was told this was an atheist country, that the, the young people were hardened by communism. They had no time for God. And yet I would preach a simple message, and some nights as many as a thousand teenagers would run to the altar, weeping and broken before God. Their hardness was curable because they had not sat under reproof. They had not hardened themselves by hearing so much of the gospel. It was a curable hardness. Beloved, I've always believed that the hardest hearts are in the house of God. And not only in the house of God, but the hardest hearts in those churches where the most powerful gospel, the purest gospel is being preached. Now, you've got to hear me this morning because there are some of you that in the sound of my voice, you're starting down the path toward a hard heart. If I were to point my finger at you, now they're here, they're among us now. Some of you have already hardened your heart and others are in the process. You're on that downward spiral toward a hard heart. You've got to hear me in the spirit. I, I know if, if I came to you and said, and, and I, I knew it in my heart and I saw something in your life and I pointed to you and said, brother, sister, you're going to develop, you're heading down a road toward a hard heart. You would say, oh, no, no, brother, if I love the Lord with all my heart. I, I can't accept that. But I want to, the Holy Ghost, open this to you now in just a few moments. Some of the hardest incurable hearts in New York City attend Times Square Church. And honestly, or sitting here, I say it kindly, or sitting here among us right now, they don't even know it. They would not believe it. Some of you have just begun to harden. You've taken the first step toward hardness. A hard heart is one that is that becomes set in its ways. Getting harder to move. Harder to stir. Until finally be able to indulge in secret sin and have a mess. I honestly believe that God many times prepares messages and he sends servants to a pulpit like this. And he ministers directly to one person, two persons, five or six. He, he, it, it will be for everybody, of course. 
a, a general message, but specifically there'll be a sin name. God will come and bear down on it because he's reaching for that black stone that's in the heart. He's trying to pluck out that sin that's hidden, that secret besetting sin. And, and finally, there can become a hardness that doesn't matter who preached, doesn't matter how powerful, how anointed, it doesn't move, it doesn't stir, it doesn't change. And still be able to praise God, raise your hands and be one of us and just love the preaching and absolutely ignore it. You can get hard attending every single service in this church. Hearing every message, you can get hard taking tapes home and hearing it the second time and only doubling your race toward hardness. You can get so hard that if Christ himself came in human flesh and preached in this pulpit, you could not hear it. Now you say, Brother Dave, you're scaring me. I don't want to scare anybody. But there has to be an understanding, a spiritual understanding that anybody who sits under godly reproof in a Holy Ghost church and folks from this pulpit has gone message after message, not only myself, Pastor Carter and all of those that God has sent. Folks, there, there have come messages from this pulpit that were so gentle, it was like rain, just gentle rain falling, and yet it was reproof. There has been... Reproof come from this pulpit that sound like rolling thunder till it shook us. I, I've stood in this pulpit at times and preached under an anointing that trembled. I, my knees would shake. Yes, I would get loud sometimes to raise my voice, but I would go home sometimes losing three to five pounds preaching one message. Broken over the body of Jesus Christ and pouring my heart out and knowing that Many of them were going to get hard under because they heard it and did not receive it. Oh, beloved, this has not been a dead church. Better to go the deadest church on the face of the earth. If you're going to get hard, if you're going to backslide, if you're not going to heed the word of God, go find the deadest church you can find so you won't be as judged severely as you would sitting in a Holy Ghost church where the word of the Lord comes forth in power and unction and purity, when that word comes forth and we do not allow it, we be, when we become only hearers and not doers of the word of God, we harden our hearts. Let me hold you to the plumb line, to the measure of the word of God. Let, let's see whether or not you've taken the first step toward hardness. Now hear me. I'm not going to yell at you, hopefully. I'm not going to shout. I've got to get this through to this body because one day I stand before the judgment seat and I have to answer. Believe me, I have to answer for what I preach to myself. Lest having preached to others, I myself become a castaway. I have to answer lest I rail on you and put a heavy burden on you and not lift a finger myself to do it. And I realized that. But this is so serious that some of us are sitting here who, who consider yourself some of the most spiritual and some of the most loving, caring, dedicated, gentle, God-fearing may be already taking the first few steps toward a hard heart. I'm going to lay the plumb line and measure you now. For example, how many times have you heard from this pulpit about the danger of neglecting daily prayer and Bible reading? I have stood in this pulpit at times with such tears. I, I have begged and pleaded because I, I have been prophesying about the hard times that are coming. We're going to have over 1,000 fires burning in this city. This city is going to turn into chaos. If you want to believe it, because Walt Disney's moved in now and everything seems so fine, the crime rate is down, but folks, it's just the calm before the storm. And I've been telling you, you cannot make it in what is coming unless you daily are shut in with God, unless this is becoming the meat. You can watch television, can you, for an hour, and yet you can't open this for five minutes. You can read magazines, you can read newspapers, and you can't daily get into this book. 
You ignore it. You can do good deeds. You can go here. You can go there and bless people and, and give your heart. You say, I'm working my fingers to the bone for Jesus. Have you been in your secret closet on your face before God? Have you been into this word getting life and preparing your heart and building yourself up for what is coming? That is the word of the Lord. That is the commandment of the Lord. It's not an option. It's something God says you can't make it without it. And you hear it and hear it. Are you doing it? If you are not doing it, you are taking the first step toward hardness of heart. Because if you can't hear that, the simplest message that is designed to heal you, help you, and sustain you in the times coming, if you won't hear the least, what will you hear? You won't hear anything. Because if you can't set, accept the baby steps, how are you going to, how are you going to cope when the Jordan overflows? If you can't take a baby step into the water, what do you do when the flood comes? So I'm telling you honestly, that if you're neglecting your life with prayer, you don't have time for God, you have time for everything else, but you don't have time for God. You are not into this book. You're headed toward a hard heart. Let's put the plumb line out again. How many times have you been warned of the awful consequences of hearing or telling gossip? How many scriptures have you heard? How many powerful warnings as though the Holy Ghost himself were taking over the voice and just speaking warning scripture after scripture of how God, the curse of God, comes on those who gossip, hear it, or tell it. How many times have you been warned? We, we had men come from South Africa, from a revival in Zululand, and stood here, and the Spirit of God came on them. They warned this body about gossip. You say, are you aware of some gossip? No, I'm not aware of any gossip. Nobody's come to me. Nobody told me anything. As far as I know, I hope everybody's clean of that, but I'm putting the measuring line, the plumb line. You've been warned and warned and warned. You can't pick up this Bible. You can't read the book of Proverbs without having the fear of God in you if you're a real man or woman of God. How can anybody gossip and then read, you sit and talk against your own brother? You talk against your own sister? And God says, I will judge you. I will cut you off. I will destroy you. And how do you hear that? This past week, did you hear or tell something against your brother? Did you hear or tell something against the pastors? And what do you do? You just say, well, I, I, I just want information. I'd like to know. No, it's not a matter of knowing. It's because there's something in your heart. Folks, I'm standing. I feel like I'm standing at the brink of hell. And people rushing toward, and I'm out there with my hands up this morning, say, wait a minute, back up. I'm trying to keep you from a hard heart. Do you still gossip in light of all the preaching, the teaching, the word? Do you still indulge in that? God help us. That is a race toward hardness of heart. Let's put out the plumb line a little deeper. What about the many warnings about hidden secret sin? I doubt there's a church in America that has taken a stronger stand against sin than this church, from this pulpit. We have, na we have named sin. We've named it by its name. We've talked about homosexuality, lesbianism. We've talked about uh, uh, adultery, uh, fornication. We've talked about all of these drugs and alcohol and all of those. But I'm talking about not only that, the secret sin of pride and indulgence of the flesh and all of the foolishness that the enemy would bring against us. What about that besetting sin, the thing that God's been dealing with in our hearts? And, and, and do you finally just say, well, I can't help it? 
Folks, we have not only preached against sin, we have preached powerfully about resurrection power. We've talked about how the Holy Ghost has been given to endure us with power. We've talked about the new covenant that God has given us where He will take your responsibility of putting a will in your heart to do right. He will take all the responsibility if you just want it, if you just hate your sin, if you just am sick of it. And we have stood in this pulpit. We've talked about justification, sanctification, mortification. I've looked over my notes. I've preached the full gospel. Every associate fastman, we have preached the full gospel. And yet, I hear of a young man just got a girl pregnant. Is active in the church. We still have people been sitting here for five years, listen, they're still committing adultery, drinking, smoking. We've got some that work in this church occasionally. I've overheard them cursing God's name, taking Christ's name in vain after hearing me preach for five years. That's a hard heart. That's a hard heart. Who, who dare sit under the reproof of God time and time again and not let it convict anymore? Do you know it's possible to love to hear preaching, approve it, uh, uh, congratulate the pastor, evangelist, and grow incurably hard even though loving to hear it? The scripture says they came to the powerful preaching of the prophet Ezekiel. The children of the people speak, saying, Come, and hear what is the word of the Lord that cometh forth from the Lord, from Ezekiel. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before you as thy people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they will show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art... Unto them is a very lovely song, and you know, like a popular singer putting on a performance. One that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they'll not do them. I've had men hug me and say, what a powerful word this morning, Pastor. And I walk away, and the Holy Ghost said he didn't hear a word. Say, I've had him say, Pastor, you are one powerful preacher. Then I hear next week. He did everything but kill his wife. Slapped her around. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And all through Hebrews, hear, if you hear his voice, don't harden. You see, the hardness has to do with hearing the voice. He, he equates hardness as a result of not hearing what you hear even in your heart. My granddad had a philosophy, make a matter glad, but nothing in between. You know what he meant? Rather does somebody get mad at you and hear it and obey it than to be all glad about it and not obey the word of the Lord. Now, I knew it was going to get very quiet this morning, but I didn't think it would get this quiet. Now, now listen to me, please. I think of people who attend church regularly, good people, even workers in this church, kind-hearted, sacrificial, so gentle. But I've pondered the question. All this week I've been pondering this question. God, how is it? How is it that people can hear and hear and hear and not be changed and not be affected by it until finally they just come to the house of God and worship and praise and be a part of the body and not be changed, still indulging in their sins and still gossiping and still doing these things that God wants out. They're really not growing. They're not, their, their lives are not being changed. And the Lord showed me that it goes all the way back to the conversion. The Bible speaks of two kinds of conversion. There is a conversion that leads to healing. 
And there's a conversion that leads to hardness. You can be converted unto hardness. Or you can be converted unto Christ and for healing and deliverance of all your sins and everything that there is. In Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the Lord sends Isaiah to a people who, who were calling evil good and good evil. See, they didn't want to give up a, a, a particular sin. There was something that had taken their heart, possessed it. If you've got something that's possessed you and you don't want to let it go, you're not going to be able to hear the word of the Lord. And to these people... Isaiah was sent by God himself, and he said, Go now, Isaiah, and turn this people <clears throat> here indeed. To tell, tell, tell this people here indeed, but don't understand. See indeed, but perceive not. Make their heart of this people fat, which it means hard. Make their hearts hard, because they've already determined they will not listen. He said... God, God knows nothing I say, nothing I do, nothing in the work of the Holy Spirit will ever change them. So go now and hurry their hardness because that's perhaps there would be somewhere along the line that they would hear. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand and convert and be healed. That's the conversion toward healing. That means, Lord, I give everything to you. I hold nothing back. Children of God then had no willingness to lay down their besetting sins. Now, I thank God. I thank God for all those who've been truly saved. Thank God for those who came to the altar and said, Lord, I'm just not voting for Jesus. I'm giving my heart. I'm giving everything. I hold nothing back, Lord. I want to walk a clean life. I want clean hands and a pure heart. But there's another kind of conversion. If you're in the army, they call it foxhole religion. Foxhole conversion, because about to go into a battle and face the bullets. And you find this particular kind in the 10th chapter of Exodus. Would you go with me, please, in your Bible to Exodus 10 very quickly, please? Exodus 10. Now, in Exodus 10, look at me, please. I'm going to talk about the kind of conversion toward hardness. This is exemplified in the, the life of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has already had seven reproofs from the Holy Ghost. Seven times Moses, the man of God, he's heard seven messages on reproof. He's saying, let my people go. And now here in the 10th chapter... The 10th chapter of Exodus, verse 2, or, or verse 3, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh. Now this is the eighth time. And said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Now look at me, please. The Bible says, And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Look at me, please. You see... Well, then what chance did he have the Lord harden his heart? This was not a divine decree. That doesn't mean he was destined to hardness. Because if you go to verse 15, verse 15, uh, or, or, or chapter, let's see, let me find it here. Chapter 8, verse 15. Chapter 8, verse 15. And when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, what does it say? He hardened his heart, hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now look at me, please. Every time he's in trouble, he would say, just get me out of this. And we got out of it, he went right back to it. Went back to his sin, right back to his hardness. Just get me out of this mess. That's all he wanted. Now, look at me, please. Now comes the eighth plague. And that kind of plague that Egypt hated most, a plague of locust. Locust. Locust came and would invade the land. Moses said, he's going to invade your houses. Your houses will be full of locusts. These locusts did come. They came in swarms. An east wind blew them in. They began to devour every green thing. They debarked all the trees. There wasn't even a baby plant left. There wasn't a blade of grass left in Egypt. And folks... 
It got into their homes, and you could imagine. They didn't have windows. They had doors, but no windows, just lattice work. And then through the lattice work would come these. Can you imagine your floor? You wives, afraid of little dust. Can you imagine the floor crawling with locusts? It's in your kneading trough for the bread. It's in the milk. It's in your clothes. It's in the bed. It's in everything. Locusts, and they even ate leather. They would eat cloth. They would eat everything, devouring. You hear the you hear the twirling of their 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 wings and the chewing and the chomping. And what an awful judgment this was. The locust who came to ruin and destroy. And folks, there's, there, there, there's a song about the army of the Lord. And a lot of people have gone into Joel 2 and said that's the army of the Lord. It's not the army of the Lord. That invading army that didn't break rank was uh, executing the judgment of God. They were locust. They were palmer worms that came to do the judgment of God. The Bible says the Lord shall... Send utter his voice before his army. And then he describes in verse 11 what that army is. The locust, the cankerworm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar. My great army, which I sent among you, that executeth my word. Execution. That is not a good army. So when you talk about Joel 2 being uh, God's glorious army, you are totally mistaken that those are the locusts coming to ruin and destroy. Now listen to me, please. Many of you have had the locusts come. God does that to, to bring about his divine order, to, to, to perform his divine will. Sometimes the Lord will allow the locusts to come. He will allow the locusts to devour and some of us, some of the guys from Teen Chat, from uh, Timothy House, and the girls from Sarah House, and the drug programs, and those, if you go down to our, our uh, Isaiah House, like yesterday, the dining room filled with street people. They've lost their families, they've lost their children, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their health, they've lost everything. The locusts have eaten everything. How did you come to the Lord? Was it after the locust had eaten everything? When you were debilitated in health and you lost everything and you were down and up? That's wonderful because the Bible said when you come to wit's end, the Lord is there. He's there faithful. Many of you came to the Lord that way, but you meant it with all of your heart. You said, oh God, I see what sin has done. I've paid the wages of sin, but I repent. I give you everything. And my Bible says then the Lord will restore everything the palmer worm has eaten. Everything the locust has eaten, he will restore. In Nehemiah 9, 16, 17, it says, Our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks, and they listened not to thy commandments and refused to obey Neither were they mindful of thy wonders, but they hardened their necks. Verse 12, chapter 10. The Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. Moses stretched forth the rod, his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. The locust went up over the land of Egypt and rested in all the coast of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there was no such locust as they, neither after them sh shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. They did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. There remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. Now listen to this. And Pharaoh, here is the conversion toward hardness. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Look at me, please. That word then, then, then Pharaoh called. Then Pharaoh repented. When? After the locust had done their work. After the locust had eaten everything. Then he calls on the name of the Lord. This sounds like a full confession. I've sinned against your God. I've sinned against you, Moses. It sounds wonderful. But, it, but it, here's the kind of repentance it is. I'm in trouble. I'm in a mess. I brought a mess down on my head. I'm in real trouble. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I've sinned. But hurry. Now listen to this. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive me, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. In other words, yeah, I did wrong. I sinned. I'm sorry. I sinned against God. I sinned against you. Now hurry, pray. Get me out of here. I'm in trouble. I have to have relief. And there are, uh, listen, if you come to Jesus that way, only because you want off drugs, you want to break a habit, you want, you, you, you see trouble. If I come to Jesus, maybe I'll prosper. I come to Jesus and maybe things will turn out. I'm in such trouble. I'm in a mess. Now, if you turn to him with all your heart, he'll, he will work miracles for you. He will do the impossible. But if you come to him just this way, and that's why some people are hardening their hearts, can sit in Times Square Church, because back when they got saved, they can tell you, 10 years ago I got saved. Five years ago, 20 years ago, I knelt at an altar. Yes, they knelt at an altar to get themselves out of some kind of a crisis. They came to Jesus to get something. They have not grown an inch. They have not changed. And there is a danger in that of getting hard. How did you get saved? Think back. When you got saved, was it just to get out of, maybe to hold a marriage together? How many husbands come to Christ just so the wife won't leave him? And vice versa. How many parents come and plead, and the only time they pray, the only time they seek God when one of the kids is in the hospital dying? Lord, get me out of the locust of eating everything. God, get me out of this. This man didn't mean it because as soon as the locusts were done the next day, he hardened his heart again. It was a phony repentance. It was a phony conversion. It was only to get relief. You can't come to Jesus just to get relief. You come to Jesus because he is God. You come to Jesus because you want to give him your life. And then when you give him everything, you get your relief. 